that's similar that's similar to the difference in size between a fish and this the size of the Manhattan, uh, the city of Manhattan. So that's really, really just a vast, vast size range. So with that um, orientation, I'm going to jump into content tonight and we'll explore um, the good, the bad, and, and maybe the not so ugly, because quite frankly, I love algae, particularly microalgae. I think they're beautiful and um, they're an inspiration to, to a lot of um, applications other, other than uh, scientific. So starting with the good, um, why should you care about algae? Why are algae important? I'm going to give you three reasons tonight. First, microalgae form the base of food webs in many aquatic systems. And so this diagram illustrates that microalgae or phytoplankton, plant floaters, are consumed by zooplankton, the animal floaters, which are consumed by consumers. And this schematic illustrates a really simple marine food chain. Um, so smaller fish are consumed by larger fish, charismatic megafauna, um, and, and seabirds. Um, real food webs are undoubtedly more complex with microbial interactions, but this is, a, a you know, I think a reasonable simplification of, of how algae can fuel um, higher trophic levels production. And a really good example of that comes from upwelling zones. If you're not familiar with an upwelling zone, um, it is a region typically on the west coast of a continent where there are surface winds that push surface waters away from shore. And when that water is displaced, um, deeper, colder water comes up to replace it from, from the deep ocean. And that deep ocean water is rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. And those nutrients fuel microalgae blooms, which then um, allow for the um, growth of zooplankton and fishes. Um, the images on the right show an upwelling zone in both natural color on the left and then on the right um, illustrating chlorophyll concentration. And chlorophyll concentration is an indicator of microalgae biomass. So the hotter colors, the yellows, the orange and reds um, mean that we have a lot of biomass there. And what's interesting is that there's a really strong link between um, blooms and fishery landings. Upwelling zones account for less than 5% of the ocean area, and yet they account for 25 to 50% of fisheries landings. Um, so that's pretty, pretty astounding. Um, so that is our first, um, first reason why algae are important. They're primary producers. Um, this is the part where we're, if we're in person, I would, I would make everyone you know, sort of get involved and, and take two deep breaths. So I, now I don't know if you're, you're doing this or not, but just pretend you're taking two deep breaths. You can close your eyes, leave your eyes open. Um, and now you can thank microalgae for one of those breaths. So microalgae produce half of the world's oxygen and take up half of the world's CO2. This is a data vis visualization of over 20 years of satellite data. Um, and what it's showing is areas of productivity, um, both on land and in the ocean. And the ocean color is represented similarly to the, the image I, I just showed, where these hotter areas, the reds and yellows, are areas of high productivity. So you'll see as the world turns, so to speak, that you have areas of high productivity along the shore. And this is due to runoff, either natural runoff, agricultural runoff, urban runoff. Um, also, you'll have areas of high productivity by upwelling zones. And then in the open ocean, that those are the regions where we, we mostly have low productivity. But you'll see in certain regions that um, you'll have bursts of, of growth. And, and these open ocean regions were, were, were interesting when they were first discovered. They were called um, high nutrient, low chlorophyll zones. And so there were these regions that had high nitrogen, high phosphorus, but, but not a lot of microalgae. And it was determined that these regions were actually limited by iron. So occasionally you'll have dust from, for example, the Sahara, blow into the open ocean and then deposit iron that allows phytoplankton or microalgae to, to bloom. And so you'll have these um, sort of temp temporal patterns. Um, so that's our second reason um, that microalgae are important. Um, third, I have one more question. Can I get, can I get really get 
group participation for this one. Have you eaten algae today? This is a yes or no question. Um, probably in salad dressing. Has anybody else eat it, eaten ice cream? Yes. Ah, uh, one, two, three. No, maybe. So indirectly, I, I really, I really like, I really like that answer. So um, probably is the answer that probably even, even if not on purpose, um, you've probably eaten some sort of algae product today. Um, so <laughs> Fab, spirulina, awesome. I'm really curious about that. Um, so the uses of algae are, are many. Um, we use algae in food, in food additives, um, as animal feed and human supplements, um, as biofertilizer, bioplastics, cosmetics, wastewater treatment, and fuel. Um, and this is sort of, you'll notice that, that all of the um, sort of products that I, or applications that I listed um, are Maybe, maybe not what you think of as the primary use of algae. If, if, we, if we go back, say, to the 1980s, 1990s, where everybody was talking about algae for fuel, um, the markets have shifted such that, that there are a lot of high value markets right now um, in food or food additives. There are cooking oils, for example, with algae. Um, and so algae is um, just a feedstock for a number of products. So that's our third region, reason why algae are important. And um, thinking about this algae as a feedstock, where, where do we acquire that algae? There are two ways that we can acquire algae. Um, the first is by harvesting it. And um, algae can be harvested from or actually cultivated in natural systems. And seaweed farming is a, is a great example of this. So seaweed farming um, actually sequest sequesters carbon, so it's carb carbon negative. Um, and it's one of the fastest growing aquaculture sectors um, on the planet. And tonight I'm going to share with you just a few video clips. I think it's really important to have a number of different voices here. You don't need to hear just my story. Um, and so this first is about seaweed farming in Alaska. And I think this is really interesting because there are some, some neat socioeconomic implications um, of seaweed farming um, that I, I think will be will be interesting as we, as we get a little bit further along in the in the talk and thinking about harmful blooms. So bear with me. Global populations are rising, but the abundance of wild fish is not. Huge strides have been made to decrease overfishing, but wild seafood harvest alone will not reach the growing demand. And so, some have turned their attention to ocean farming. We use bowl kelp to make salsa, pickles, seasonings, and hot sauce. Here in Alaska, where cultivation and harvesting of the sea is known as mariculture, new marine business ventures are being discovered. There's been a lot of interest already among fishermen or people who are involved in the more traditional fisheries in Alaska in starting to participate in mariculture, the farming of shellfish or seaweed, because one, this could be a more reliable harvest for them, and it's super, super sustainable. I think a lot of people are interested in supplementing their income or buffering their fishing season with the growing of kelp and the long term that could become people's main livelihoods. Bull kelp. A remarkable seaweed that has been traditionally harvested from wild crops is among the growing number of species being farmed in the United States. Here in the town of Ketchikan, kelp product manufacturers have teamed up with oyster farmers to grow this seaweed. Kelp was a largely undeveloped market in the U.S. and had enough data to support it that convinced a few of us to, to add that to our permit. So I think if we can bring in a little bit more revenue um, annually, then that's that's fun for me. Seafood farming, if done responsibly, as it is in the United States, is increasingly recognized as one of the most environmentally sustainable ways to produce food and protein. So farming kelp has some really exciting benefits, not just because it provides such awesome food, but because it actually benefits the ecosystem. You plant it out in the fall, it grows extremely fast, and it's pulling excess carbonic acid from the ocean, 
which buffers ocean acidification. What's amazing about farming seaweed and mariculture is there are ultimately no inputs. So you take seed from a wild uh, specimen and plant it out on lines. There's no fresh water, no fertilizer, no arable land that's necessary to grow this amazing product. This is ingenuity and entrepreneurship at its finest in a wild and pure place. Creating foods that are not only good for you, but taste good too. Whole kelp with all the salts and minerals that are in it provide a really rich umami base flavor. So it's just gonna be a richer, more savory tasting salsa than you're used to eating. This trend will continue to spread throughout Alaska and worldwide. By growing seafood near communities, it reduces the impact on the sea and ensures a safe, secure, and sustainable local seafood supply. We have 35,000 miles of coastline throughout our state, and we have pristine water and people who know how to use boats and operate the maritime economy. Diversifying U.S. seafood production can expand and stabilize seafood supply in the face of environmental change and economic uncertainty, while also providing year-round jobs and enhancing coastal resilience in Alaska and around the nation. Okay, so... Um... I appreciate that video and the linkages between um, traditional fisheries and um, sort of these these new mariculture industries. Um, when we think about harvest, we can also harvest microalgae. Um, okay, so we can harvest um, microalgae as well, um, but this is obviously not as easy as as going to the ocean and literally cutting kelp. Um, out of the sea. Um, so the water needs to be separated from the microalgae. And so that's a technical, technical challenge um, with, with harvest. Um, and in addition, um, natural blooms are, are not um, necessarily predictable in quality. So through the life cycle of, of the algae, the biomass composition can change or the quality can be bad. So for products, we really don't want stinky algae. We don't want algae that has toxins. Um, that said, harvested material can be used for certain products. And these images come from a company called Algix that is harvesting and or partnering with harvesters to acquire biomass that's then used to develop, this, um, to develop polymers. And so this is a really great example of how we can use a waste product, algae, that we don't want in water bodies and put it into a circular um, bioeconomy. Um, and if, um, if composition is important, the other way to acquire algae is by cultivating that. And so in cultivation, you have a strain of interests or multiple strains of interest, and you scale those from very small scales like tubes or flasks, and you typically cultivate them outdoors in open ponds. And algal cultivation can be carbon neutral, so it can be coupled with remediation, for example, uh, remediation of wastewater, um, re um, or can use um, sources of, of flue gas. Um, that said, the algal cultivation industries that exist right now do not necessarily do that. So, so there are some farms that feed their ponds with CO2. There are farms that use, um, use agricultural um, fertilizers. And so we have a little ways to go on the cultivation end of things. Um, these are a few images of, of algal cultivation systems. The top image comes from a farm in New Mexico. Really, really cool place. Um, it feels like you're out at the ocean. Um, when you're there, it smells like the ocean and there are one and two acre ponds. Um, we can harvest these algae through filtration um, or with um, technologies that come from wastewater treatment plants. So this image on the bottom left shows a dissolved air filtration unit. And basically you add a polymer um, to, to the pond and um, or to the product um, and that algae flocculates, gets all clumpy and you can sort of scrape, scrape that algae off um, we also have the capability to do experiments and ex 
for experiments, you, you really don't want to do experiments with the two acre sale, scale. That's not, not tractable. And so we have smaller ponds or mini ponds that we can ask um, biological, ecological questions. Um, and these are really, really neat for manipulating a bunch of different um, ponds in different ways and figuring out how to maintain um, high productivity with the least uh, amount of amount of money or amount of inputs. Um, and so research and development now really is focused on um, increasing productivity and reducing costs. A few years ago, algae was listed as a um, agricultural commodity by the USDA. And since that point, there's been, um, well, and, and before as well, there's been um, sort of increased federal coordination on algae research in the US. And so if you're interested in what that looks like, I would um, refer you to this report put out by the Interagency Working Group on Algae, the Federal Activities Report on the Bioeconomy Algae, and it's freely available um, online. So with that, I'm going to um, turn to algae that we that we really don't don't want to see that we're we're not excited about the um, sort of bad algae, and these are harmful algal blooms. A harmful algal bloom is the growth or accumulation of algae well above normal normal levels, and these blooms are caused by both microalgae as well as macroalgae. And many have taxa produce biotoxins that can be harmful to the environment and can be harmful to humans. Um, and these images are just of different blooms um, across, across the planet, my, microalgae as well as macroalgae. Harmful algal plumes are a global phenomenon. Um, and in the US, all 50 states are affected by toxic blooms. This map shows the um, prevalence of blooms in freshwater systems, um, so inland systems far from, from the coastlines. And this map shows um, the prevalence of blooms along the coastlines. And what you'll notice is that you have certain taxa um, or certain poisoning syndromes that are found in certain locations. For example, in the Gulf of Mexico, these blue circles um, represent neurotoxic shellfish poisoning caused by an organism um, known as Grania brevis. And typically that organism resides in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but occasionally those blooms are transported around the tip of Florida along the East Coast, and they've been documented as far north as North Carolina. Um, there are other taxa that, that really are more um, ubiquitous. They're sort of everywhere and they're really um, able to thrive in a lot of different environments. The um, harmful algal blooms threaten ecosystems, human health, and economies, and I'm going to touch on each of these over the next couple of slides. With respect to ecosystem damage, the first thing we notice is water discoloration. So the images on the top, um, the top left image is a satellite image from NOAA, um, and that is of the Mississippi River plume. The rightmost images are of blooms in Florida by a cyanobacterium and by the dinoflagellate Perennia brevis. Um, so these blooms will discolor the water. They will deplete oxygen, resulting in fish kills and mammal mortalities. They'll result in a loss of habitat. And I mentioned that some blooms um, produce toxins. And so the um, red tide organism, Crania brevis, does produce a potent neurotoxin. And so these um, dead manatees and dead fish, um, they, they died from toxin exposure. In the case of manatees, um, the neurotoxin paralyzes the manatee and it's not able to lift its head up to breathe air. And so it suffocates. You can rescue manatees. They're actually um, really cute and really sad when they're being rescued. So you pull them out of the water and you can float them on a pool noodle in, um, in pools filled, filled with uh, salt water. And um, with time, they will detox and then you can put them back when the, when the water is safe. Um, during 2020, 2021, Florida experienced a really, really um, devastating bloom of Crania brevis and over 1400 manatees um, were killed. And so sometimes you just can't keep up with that, that sort of damage. Blooms also threaten human health and the roots of exposure there include contact, inhalation and consumption. So if you go swimming in, in a bloom, um, 
you can experience skin irritation, a rash. Typically, if you shower, those, those symptoms are minor. Um, some taxa produce toxins um, whose who, uh, toxins that can become aerosolized with winds or with sea spray. Um, and for most people, when we breathe in those toxins, we experience respiratory irritation. And that can present as um, a tickle in the throat, coughing, sneezing, itchy, watery eyes. Um, but for people with chronic health conditions, at-risk populations, people specifically with respiratory conditions, these symptoms can be much more severe and require um, medical attention. And the third route of exposure is consumption. So um, we can be exposed to toxins by drinking contaminated water or eating contaminated shellfish and occasionally fish. Um, and this table illustrates some of the different poisoning syndromes associated with both uh, marine and freshwater harmful algal bloom taxa. And you can tell by some of their names, these symptoms, um, they're not, the, the syndrome names that these symptoms are just not, not pleasant. Um, some of these syndromes are fatal. Um, for example, amnesic shellfish poisoning is caused by a diatom, really a beautiful diatom, but it produces a nast nasty toxin called demoic acid. Um, and that results in nausea, vomiting, respiratory distress, disorientation, seizure, seizures, and memory loss. Um, that can be fatal. Um, interestingly, um, I don't know if folks have seen Alfred Hitchcock's movie, The Birds, but um, the inspiration for that movie, at least in part, came from amnesiac shellfish poisoning. So when birds consume contaminated shellfish uh, or shellfish contaminated with tomoic acid, um, they really become disoriented and just can fly very, very erratically. Um, and so I don't mean to scare anybody with this table. Um, generally, shellfish testing programs keep supply chains safe in our country, um, but there is definite risk to um, populations that harvest shellfish from outside of shellfish harvesting areas, for example, indigenous populations, um, or um, to people who illegally harvest uh, shellfish. And so um, the communication there um, needs to be strong with respect to um, testing and, and getting information out to the people who need it. Um, there are undoubtedly economic costs and costs of remediation of blooms. Annually, harmful algal blooms cost billions per year. And then individual events can have pretty high ticket, ticket prices. Um, and I, I worked with um, Gulf of Mexico shellfish farmers for, for about five years, and, and it was really devastating. There were years that farmers um, lost their leases, lost their businesses, and lost their homes. So these blooms can have, have real impacts on, on people um, at, at local levels. And so, um, you know, one question is, well, what do we do about blooms? How can we stop blooms? Um, bloom management is typically divided into three categories, prevention, control, and mitigation, um, and collectively this is called PCM. And um, in our country, PCM efforts focus largely on, on mitigation, so reducing the impacts of blooms, but not necessarily um, effectively preventing or controlling those blooms. I mean, I, and I think that's um, starting to shift with um, a couple of efforts. So HAB prevention includes um, reduction of nutrients um, and managing of, of water systems. And this can happen at the level of individuals, um, as well as um, you know, municipalities, states at the federal level. Nutrient reduction would include reducing fertilizer inputs, reducing runoff to aquatic systems, employing smart farming, adding riparian zones outside of aquatic systems, and water management would include managing flows, outputs, wastewater, and stormwater. Um, if blooms aren't prevented, then we're tasked with controlling them. And there are a number of different ways in which we control blooms physically, um, chemically, biologically. Unfortunately, control methods are more developed for freshwater cyanobacterial HABs, um, at least in the US, um, than they are for other HABs. And, and so treatment works well if the, the areas are small, closed systems, um, and treatment works less well or is not done in, in larger open systems um, or the coastal ocean.
And so then um, our aim with mitigation is to minimize public health risks by closing shellfish harvesting areas, um, putting in drinking water advisories. And here there's a strong focus on monitoring blooms, predicting blooms, and then communicating that information about blooms um, to stakeholders and, and to the public. Um, and this, um, the second video that I have, um, with the ducks. Um, this talks about cyanobacterial hubs and a tool that's out there for everybody to use today on Bloom. So if you're going to a freshwater system, this is something you can access federally um, to get information about, about systems you might be uh, visiting. All around the world, a tiny organism is causing a big problem. These life forms are called cyanobacteria and they're growing in abundance. While normal amounts are an important part of the food web, under the right conditions, these organisms can wreak havoc on ecosystems. It often starts when excess nutrients flow into a body of water. This, combined with warm waters and lots of sunshine, create just the right conditions for an algal bloom. These blooms can release harmful toxins that, when touched or consumed, can cause sickness and even death. As our climate continues to warm, these toxic blooms may become more and more common. The good news? We can use satellites to measure water color that can indicate if a bloom is present. This helps water managers know where they should test for harmful toxins. NASA and our partners are developing tools so that anyone can access this data to check the status of their local lakes and reservoirs. Clean fresh water is important for recreation and health. NASA helps track that water from space so that we can continue to enjoy this vital resource. Okay, um, a question that I commonly get asked is, are HABs worsening? And this has been a really controversial question over the last few decades. And I think here it's really important to separate um, the different mechanisms of change. For example, we know that harmful algal blooms have gotten worse with the pollution of um, aquatic environments, both freshwater environments, coastal environments. Um, teasing apart the effects of global warming, ocean acidification, um, that sort of more difficult. Um, recently, there was a paper that was published just in the last couple of months, I believe, by HAB experts around the world that the perceived global increase in blooms was really attributable to um, intensified monitoring and understanding bloom impacts. Um, and that's that's interesting. I think there are some, some caveats um, to this paper as there um, always are. But, but I think the take home message there is that um, some taxa, some blooms are, are definitely getting worse and, and some, are, some are not. So the changes are in, in multiple directions. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna wrap up. I'd like to leave you with a couple of um, just images of um, different algae, some of, some of my favorites. Um, this talk was entitled The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, but I really think um, algae are, are quite beautiful, and they have been an inspiration for a number of different um, art exhibits um, around, around the world. Here are just a, a couple of examples. Um, and then I'll share with you images of, of a few groups of microalgae. And on each of these slides, um, the plates on the right are illustrations from Ernst Haeckel. Um, some of you are probably familiar with, um, with his work. Um, so the first group of microalgae is diatoms, and these are radially or bilaterally symmetrical cells. And so they have these halves um, like this, and when they divide, their halves split in two, and then they build other halves to fill in, fill in the gaps. And so with division, the cells get smaller and smaller. Um, and they have really ornate glass shells or frustules. And the thicker those frustules are, the less likely they are to be eaten by someone. And oh, I mean someone, I mean um, zooplankton. So these thicker frustules deter grazing. These are some images of 
my favorite plankton, um, starting in the upper left, um, this, uh, Ast this is Asterionolopsis, and it's a chain forming cell that chains and sort of loops around itself. Um, this is a pennate diatom, uh, probably Nichtia, and some of the Nichtias will glide over surfaces. Um, this is Didylum, Catoceros with very long spines, Planktonella sole, obviously looks like a sun, and Guanardia. Um, the dinoflagellates are another group, and to me, they look like aliens or spaceships. They can have cellulose plates, um, or they can be naked. So the illustrations by Heckel, um, all of those dinos have cellulose plates. They have flagella that allow them to migrate vertically in the water column. And some of them have two flagella, um, one flagellum that allows them to twist and turn and another that propels them. And they have resting stages that are seed-like cysts. Um, and these are some images of those, of those cysts. And we're just beginning to understand um, reproduction and life history in these organisms, um, really applying some, some concepts from terrestrial uh, ecology and biology. And these are some dinos. Um, this dino on the top left is bioluminescent. So this is Noctiluca, I believe. Oh, I should, I should know that one. This one is, is, is possibly a Gonialex. Um, these winged dinoflagellates are dinophysis. A couple of naked dinoflagellates are Crenia. And this one with the cellulose plates is, is Ceratium. And then finally, we have chlorophytes. So chlorophytes are the green algae. They can be free living or symbiotic in lichens and corals. Um, they have flagellated cells and most live in freshwater systems, but some live on land and some in the ocean. And this image here is of watermelon snow. So a chlorophyte that lives in snow and produces a really red pigment called astaxanthin. And with that, I will leave you with a few take home messages. So um, first, algae just have astounding diversity. They're everywhere on our planet and they play important roles in our lives. They produce the oxygen we breathe, they support ecosystems, and they provide a feedstocks for a variety of products. Um, some do produce toxins and they can be harmful when they bloom. Um, and bloom management requires coordinated effort to prevent and control outbreaks as well as mitigate negative effects. And with that, I'm happy to take questions or um, have a discussion. Awesome. Uh, sweet. We do have a couple questions. Outside of cultivation, are there any other promising commercial production methods for microalgae? Okay, um, so I might need a clarifying um, question on that, but there are, di there are different ways of, of cultivating algae, um, different approaches. So the cultivation system that I showed of an open cultivation pond is only one approach. Algae can be cultivated in bioreactors, algae, algae can be cultivated in sort of um, fixed um, pellets or particles. So there are different modes of, of cultivation, um, and that can happen either with monocultures, with polycultures, or in some sort of synthetic biology chain. Does that does that answer the question, or, the, or is there was I missing a piece of that question? I can see that um, question in the chat, Kristen. Yes, perfect. Okay, awesome. I see that. Um, and then the next one is, what is the role of toxins in algae? <laughs> Babs, that is a good question. Um, yeah, there, there. I think there's a there are a lot of um, speculations there, um, and folks think that toxins have evolved. I mean, one possibility is that toxins evolved as as a defense mechanism. Um, there, are, there's a lot of um, different roles of chemicals in in it in the aquatic environment, and so I think more broadly we can think about toxins as being, being molecules of communication, um, but you might actually have other ideas, Bab, Babs. We can let you think on it. We're not putting you on spot. Hmm. So Sounds the next good. question, oh, he has no idea. Maybe. No idea. Let me, <laughs> let me also think about that a little bit more because there was a time when I thought about toxins a lot and now it's not really that time. Um, so Stephanie, is there any concern with 
mariculture industries affecting, I was wondering this too, <laughs> affecting diversity or distribution of natural and macro algal communities, since these are essentially not super, enclo super enclosed or is mimicking the diversity of natural systems enough to prevent any determinant. And then there's a second half to that. Right. So I think what Stephanie is asking is, you know, we're going out into systems and we're planting monocultures, but possibly, you know, that's not what systems looked like. And so are there are there downsides to that? Um, I think for a, a lot of mariculture, the answer um, could be yes. And I, you know, I think more about about fisheries. So there's there's a real problem when we start to put um, monocultures of fishes out into an enclosure and we're feeding those fishes and it's really intensive um, and there's a lot of pollution. My suspicion, Stephanie, I'm not I'm not a kelp person, but my suspicion is that the kelp beds are planted much like kelp beds would be planted in places where there's space. Um, but that's a that, that's a really good good question. Um, and I think I think we could look that up. Um, and the second half, I think you just answered, which is um, that is to say, have any negative impacts to right. the natural algal right. communities. Yeah. And so I mean, I do know that the the kelps grow pretty quickly. And you know, while they're there, um, they're still they're still being used as habitat. Um, so that, that's a good question. Like what happens the moment they're harvested? What are what are the cascading effects on the communities? Um, that's a that's a really good question. I don't have I don't have an answer there. I was also wondering if it was something that was, you know, like sounds a little bit about like banana cultivation, like they're planted and they grow really fast and they would like rip them up and they replant basically, or they cut it down and they have it grow again, but it's kind of wasteful. Um, but the kelp from what they were showing didn't look that wasteful. Right, um, right, right. Okay, um, seaweed farmers, Thomas has a response. Seaweed farmers are growing natural, naturally occurring species, but on ropes as opposed to the natural substrate. That is a good point. Yep, exactly. Okay, so I had a question actually about, um, you mentioned that the al algae that is found in lichen ha can have flagellum or flagella. Is that do is that true? <laughs> or at least some of the species that are also found in lichen? Yeah, I I, sus I don't know that for sure, Kristen. I suspect that's true. Um, I remember the moment. I remember where I was when I discovered that lichens could have diatoms in them. It was 1996 and there was a paper that came out in the Journal of Psychology, a great, great cover shot. Um, but I do know that lichens ha can have a variety of different algae inside of them. I suspect um, that the functional use of flagella while, while algae is in a lichen, if that's true, is not really, um, there, there's not really a function, but yeah. You're, you're all of these questions, you're stumping me. My background is in HABs and algae ecology. I have never studied lichens, but maybe one day I will. Like um, does anybody else know about the lichens? I bet we could Google it. I bet you we could. <laughs> does anyone have any other questions? Give me a second. Well, thank you for hosting this, Kristen. It was fun. Yeah, of course. Thank you so for so much for sharing this um, information. I am an algae nerd, so it was really exciting to hear you talk for me. And I hope for everyone else tonight as well. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. You're getting a couple thank yous in the chat, which you can see right now. And um, in case anyone is interested we have a lot of upcoming programs there's also an evaluation coming your way after right after this talk probably in the next couple of days please take a moment to fill out that evaluation tell us what you would like to see in the future it's always great to get your feedback so thank you for that in advance and again thank you everyone for joining us and that's it for the evening thank you so much thank you yeah bye bye